So a question for pretty much any of the scientists here. Um, what role do you think uh, do, do experimental physics play in today's uh, theoretical research in general? I, I can, maybe I can start to give an answer. It plays a very important role because uh, theoretical research is based on trying to understand what we observe in the outside world. And if you look at the great uh, theoretical achievements since, let's say, the 19th century, all is based on experiments. Maxwell's equation comes after the work of Ampere and Faraday, which were just observation of electro electric and magnetic phenomena. And then uh, this happened again for quantum physics. Einstein in, in the year 1905 was trying to explain the photoelectric effect which had just been uh, understood and he developed the theory, he started quantum theory. Uh, there are some uh, cases in which the lack of uh, connection with theory leads to uh, a, some blind alley. When after the year 1920s, Einstein had a dream which was to try to unify uh, gravity and quantum physics and electromagnetism, and it was a failure. He did not succeed. At that time, he was obsessed by this theoretical idea, but g gave only a very uh, distracted interest into the developments of experiments in the 1920s and 30s, which were very important. He stopped, he was not directly interested in nuclear physics, in condensed matter physics, and so he went away from experiments, and this was not good for, he, for the development of theory. Now you have string theory, which is supposed to, which has been advocated for a long time to be the theory of everything, but for the time being, it's just a mathematical uh, uh, structure and it has no direct connection with the reality and this is one of the problems. So in physics at least you need to be driven by experiments even if the theory are very abstract and even if the theories also obey to other uh, 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 try to solve other kind of problems. Some people have said that the theory is uh, true if it is beautiful and then it, but that for that you have to define what beautiful is in, in mathematics and in science, but it, a theory can be beautiful and wrong if it doesn't explain facts. So that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I, I will say almost the same because I think th theory is very important and very often you start by theoretical research, but then you have to make experiment to uh, demonstrate that your theory it's good, it's right. Uh, and uh, if not, you have uh, some time to abandon your theory and try to imagine a new one. So uh, I think experiment, uh, both are very important. Experimental science and theoretical science, they go together for me, uh, clearly. And uh, very often, as a result, we should uh, have applications that are often uh, derived from scientific evidence. Uh, so it's, it's a loop somehow. Just one thing that relates to that, we have uh, on the one hand theory that is understanding and thinking, and I like that definition. We have experimental work which is observing the real world, but nowadays computation is a very, very large field, a field that's growing, and in computation you have analysis, but you also have simulation. You can also try out scenarios. You have uh, virtual reality. So in some ways, I think we now have a triad where we used to have a dyad. Next question. Um, yes, so um, does, uh, when, does it uh, when you receive prizes such as Nobel Prizes, Fields Medals, or Abel Prizes, does it change the way you work, or does it affect your state of mind at work, and does it have like negative consequences actually, maybe like more pressure, more stress, or is it, is it bad actually? I mean. 
So I can answer this question since I, I obtained this Abel Prize last year. And I am still, as a student, I am trying to understand a problem I can't understand. Every morning I, try, I am trying to prove a lemma. I am failing. So, and my, my opinion now is that they just made a mistake giving, giving me the Abel Prize last year because I am so stupid, you know. I'm still so stupid. And that's good for, for being a scientist. You have to feel you are completely stupid. And you have, you have to, to try to, to fight as hard as possible to become slightly more clever. And when suddenly you, you prove your theorem, it was so obvious. You were even more stupid because the proof was obvious. Uh, it's now 10 years for me that I got the Nobel Prize. I can tell you that my, my, my life has totally changed. I used to say I had my life before HIV AIDS, I, and then I had my life after the Nobel Prize. It's a lot of uh, pressure. It's a lot of uh, requests coming from everywhere coming from scientists, but not only scientists, maybe because of the, the field that I was working on, uh, but uh, it's politician, it's uh, media, it's uh, everybody uh, asking uh, for uh, intervention, asking for advice, even sometime on area, area where you are not at all expert. Uh, every day, I can tell you, even 10 years after, I'm requesting request more than 10 every day. <laughs> uh, and still today, I must say that uh, my emails uh, that I receive every day, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I cannot manage alone. I, I think uh, I agree with uh, that. And I think I was lucky to, to get the prize at the end of my uh, career when I was close to retirement. I think it's even worse if you get it young. So I think this is one advantage of the Nobel Prize. We don't have this 40-year limit of the field medal. I think for the field medal, it's, it, the problem is even more serious because you, when you get it before 40 and you have all these uh, uh, requests and, and you have really to be strong to be able to resist to that. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Maybe not everybody wants to have the same question. So. Uh, I will say just two sentences. One that I agree with all was said here, but this can be dealt with. The second, before I got the prize, young people were not interested in, or were less interested in, in our work or in science. There was a poll in Tel Aviv Main Street, and only 9% of this young people, 17, 18 years old, say they want to go to science. And then two months later, I got the prize, and three times more people, more young people, say they want to go to science. And this is my biggest victory. Yeah, so about this question of the prize. After my Nobel Prize, my research slowed down during two years, I suppose, two or three years. And then I came back to the research very actively for several reasons, because there are always uh, many ideas to explore. And so you cannot stop an idea and say, I cannot explore this way. So, and so I have been very productive during the recent years. And the second reason, when you are, I have a very good team of co-workers and who we are in a good team, you cannot leave the team. It's like uh, being in a sport team. Uh, okay, so I want to be uh, again with my team and favors the advance of each member of the team. Okay. So I, I, I don't feel that I've had much of a change in my life. I think that uh, work is still key to me. Um, I'm quite good at email and uh, 
telephone, so actually I can handle the, the load quite easily. Um, I guess uh, life was wonderful before and it's still wonderful. Um, you get older, but that's part of life. Okay, thank you. So you know, uh, you see uh, there are different answers to your question. So it's a question for everyone here, all the searchers. So we live in a, a society with a lot of trouble, new trouble, new problems, uh, problems which use science to, 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 to their attentions. So like some searchers here said, um, science is used, uh, is, is made for the benefit of the, the, that's the, the humanity, but it's also used for bad intentions uh, also now. So what's your advice as searchers for young people, young gener generations, to fight that bad utilization of science? And that's all. So my advice to young people, to old people, to girls, to boys, to everybody, don't look for advices. Do what your heart tells you and what you are good at and what is interesting for you, what you are curious about. Don't look at other people. They are always different than you. Don't look for advices. Uh. I agree entirely with Ada. Just uh, one remark, and that is, do what you like and do what you're good at is the same thing. Because what you like is what you're good at, and what you're good at is what you like. So don't listen to anybody. I'm with Ada. We disagree for agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> Just to add one thing there, I think uh, I agree with both my esteemed colleagues, um, but I think in science, as in everything else, there are mentors, there are certain people, maybe a teacher, maybe someone you meet at this meeting here, who, who impress you in more than just their advice, by their personality, by their example. And I think that's something which you can learn from other people. Most people who have done very well, can remember one or two people in their lives that changed the way their life was. So that is important. Question? Question for a young lady? Ah. I've got a question for a person who received the Nobel Prize. So if you hadn't received the Nobel Prize, would your career, career will be the same? Yeah, I said that if you... Uh, if you didn't receive the Nobel Prize, would your career will be the same? Uh, I, I, I will answer to that because I, I'm sure there is different opinion according to which stage of our career we got the Nobel Prize. As Serge said before, uh, I was lucky enough to, to get the Nobel Prize at the end of my career. Uh, so it did not change really anything to my, my, the evolution of my career itself because the career was already done. Uh, it changed my life, it changed the possibility for me uh, to, to try to be the voice of others uh, for political uh, uh, reasons, for example. Um, but it did not really change my career. The career was done. I, I want to add something. I think one should not mythify the Nobel Prize too much. The, the, the number of Nobel Prizes is very limited because there is a rule saying that you cannot get more than three a year. There are a lot of people who did not get it and who are worth the Nobel Prize, who are at the same level and who achieved things which are as important as the one that Nobel Prize winners 
have uh, done. So Nobel Prize is a matter of circumstances. To some extent, it's a matter of luck also because the committee has to choose between different topics and uh, one should, okay, it's, it gives us what, is, what has changed since the Nobel Prize. Of course, it's a lot of duties, a lot of solicitations, but I think what we think we have to do then is to be uh, the advocates for science in general and also to represent the community of researchers who have been which have been working in the same field as we did and who may have deserved the prize too. And it's what I am trying to do, to talk about the kind of physics I am doing, about atomic physics, laser physics, quantum information, because I think it's a very important field. And when I talk about that, I don't talk only about my own research, but I try to convey the importance and the excitement of all this research which is going around. I think that when you get the Nobel Prize, of course, your life is changing. And when you see something, people listen to you. I think that the most important aspect of the Nobel Prize is that the people learn about science and they learn about things that the media generally do not explain. But you know, I think that's not finished. A real scientist really uh, sees that what he has understood in the nature is only a small part of what has to be understood. And a real scientist should consider himself as a student forever. You know, the, the most important things for me is to learn new things, is to have time for reading, for discussing with people, for you know, I remember some story with my master, Alfred Kassler, which I mentioned in my talk. When he, you know, he retired, I think six years after the Nobel Prize, he was very busy with a lot of commitment, a lot of committees to follow. And when he retired, he told me, look, now I will have more time. And we will have time to start learning quantum mechanics. And I would like to spend some time discussing with you. That was a great lesson for me. The lesson is that you have always to learn new things and you have to consider yourself as a mod modest student. Of course, it's not because you have no win the Nobel Prize that you know everything. You have to learn. So I can say, after the Nobel Prize, we have to work more because you have new responsibilities. And so the new responsibilities are, for example, discussion with politicians. We have been several times together and we search to see the President de la République. Uh, and he was successful, huh? yeah? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you, uh, Francoise was with us also. Eh? Okay, and so also teaching, that is, I am going, giving presentation in schools, primary school, high schools, to motivate the young people uh, to for science. And we have, you, you, did, you do these sort of things too. And, and so there is a lot of work more. We have to work more because also there is always the attraction by the new idea in science. Uh, and okay, and with some additional advantage, of course, when you have a Nobel Prize, there is you are more attractive for young researchers to attract very smart researchers in your lab, eh, of course, and also maybe to 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 have more money for the experiments. Eh, sometimes, yeah, it worked sometimes for me. <laughs> uh, uh, also, I will say, uh, coming back to another question, the interest for the, for the society, and so an important point in the link between the formal research in the uh, universities and, and the industry and the economy. And because this is a, a difficult problem in many countries. In Europe, the, this uh, connection between the two communities is not so easy. And so I don't know how to work in Israel, if you have this uh, good connection. Yeah, certainly, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, in France, there are some attempts to improve this connection. For example, the creation by the CNRS of a joint lab between um, uh, CNRS and uh, uh, companies. Uh, for example, I am very glad to, um, to be among the founder, uh, founders of um, uh, a common lab between CNRS and the company Thales. And so we are working very well that this we can continue fundamental physics, but with is easier for us to, uh, to, 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 to give the, some idea of developments to the industry, not only to Thales, but in general to the industrial community. Oui. I think the question was already introduced, but not answered. Um, do you believe in the existence of an absolute truth, um, perhaps as a goal for science? Um, and if yes, could it ever be reached by humanity? Very quickly, I think that truth is like a recipe. So, uh, you know, it isn't the only way to do something, but if I say that you shouldn't jump from there because you could get hurt because of gravity, you can try if you want, and you'll discover quite quickly that it's a bad thing to do. And I think almost all of truth in science is a prediction about the future based on our experiences, and if the prediction more or less works, it's truth. I think it's, it's, it's a very pragmatic view that I have. For a mathematician, this is an easy question to answer. I mean, a physicist needs to somehow have his experiments to make sure that what he's doing has some relation to the truth. But a mathematician, basically, if we're competent, then what we're saying is the truth. I mean, that's somehow a very simple answer. Uh, there was a famous mathematician, one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. His name was Paul Erdos. Maybe some of you have uh, known about him. He published 1,500 papers. Uh, and uh, he, he was universally worshipped. He, uh, he, Hungarian, after the um, Second World War, War, he traveled around the world a lot, and he often came to Israel. One day he gave a colloquium lecture at the Mathematics Colloquium in Israel. In, in Jerusalem, I'm sorry, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, he started out by saying, I'll say it in Hebrew, Ani kvaza ken v'tashush v'ani lo yachol ledaber, which means I'm already very, very old, and I'm very uh, weak, and, and I really can't give an interesting talk anymore. Well, we knew that that was false, so we said to him, Professor Erdos, you're wonderful. Please, please give your talk. And though he kept on saying, I'm very old and very weak, and uh, I can't give a talk. So uh, we said, please do give a talk. And he said, I'm already two billion years old. Two billion years old? What do you mean, Professor Erdos? So uh, he said, well, it's very simple. When I was a young man, the, the uh, earth was two billion years old. Now, today is four billion years old. So, so it must be that I am two billion years old, so please let me off, yes? Uh, okay, that's as far as truth and science are concerned. I think there are two levels of truth. In, in science, you have facts, observation, and you have theories. There is absolute truth in facts. A fact is a fact, and that's why I'm so upset about fake news. There is no way to have fake news in science. You have to admit that the facts are real. Now, about theories, you can never prove that a theory is true. The only thing you can prove is that the theory is wrong. You can falsify a theory if it does not answer, if it does not uh, explain the facts or if it predicts facts which are not observed. 
So theories are evolving, but it does not mean that everything is possible, that relativism is a good thing. I think theories are evolving, going towards the truth, but an absolute truth will never be obtained because you will always find new experiments. You will always find that old theories are at best an approximation of new theories. When, when uh, quantum physics and relativity happens, they did not uh, destroy Newtonian physics. They just said Newtonian physics was an approximation of a real theory at a higher level. So in this sense, truth evolves but one should not fall into uh, just saying that uh, science is determined by the condition in which science is being done. There is no, this kind of relativism, I am very strongly against it. There is a truth, an objective truth we are going for, and uh, that's what the best we can do. And understand that truth will evolve, but it will evolve because it will always be challenged by the observation and by facts. And it's a kind of virtuous circle. Because when theory evolves, they predict new phenomena. These phenomena lead to the development of new instruments. And these new instruments allow you to check the theories with a higher and higher precision. I will just give you an example. When gravitational waves were detected two years ago, they were detected because uh, gravitational wave antennas were constructed and they were built with lasers and lasers were coming from basic science. So you see, basic science allows to develop instruments which allow us to interrogate nature with higher and higher precision. And this is virtuous circle. At some point, one finds maybe that theories have to be corrected, and that's how things work. So it's a kind of uh, science, a kind of web, is a kind of uh, uh, tapestry that you are uh, knitting over and over again, and that's what truth is about in science, I think. Um, so we know that just um, 48 women got the Nobel Prize. Do you think that it's more difficult to women to have a Nobel Prize or not? For, for which reason? Because if they include, the, this is not because uh, they are less intelligent, but do you think um, there's stereotypes who... I, I can explain it. <laughs> Est-ce que vous pensez qu'il y a des stéréotypes, enfin, des choses qui empêchent les femmes d'avoir euh, des prix ou des choses comme ça, ou ça la visibilité euh, dans le domaine scientifique Je ne pense pas vraiment que nous avons des stéréotypes. Je pense que c'est une évolution de la évolution de la science au fil des années. Si je regarde à l'époque, quand j'ai commencé ma carrière à uh, l'Institut Institute as a young uh, student, uh, it was very, very few uh, uh, women as professor at Pasteur at that time. And now, I mean, uh, almost we have uh, the same number of professors and, 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 and men at Pasteur. So I guess it's, a, it's, a, it's just a question for me of uh, evolution of uh, the career of uh, women, uh, which are fortunately uh, progressing. Uh, and uh, we still have some time to wait, but we can see that during the last, uh, uh, let's say, 10 years, or even a little bit more, it has been more women rec recognized by the Nobel Committee also than before. So uh, we will see some progress, I'm sure, in, in the future, but we are coming from a very, very, very long way. So society was not encouraging women to go to science. Now it is not politically correct to say women are not for science. But society is still, although there is, sorry, although there is very much development as we just heard and, and evolutionary development, still society is sometimes, many times, not, not very, uh, encouraging, like 
They won't tell, don't go to science because it's not uh, good for women, because it's not politically correct, as I said. But look, look, look in the balcony there. You see this woman? She's so ugly. She can be only a scientist. So this is a, a way to say, don't go to science. Do you hear when we go down the stairs, behind this door, there is always a baby crying? Because his mother is a scientist. So, so society is still less, maybe even much less supportive. Also, female think that they want to do, many of them, I don't want to say all, but many want to do good science, not that went to science, they like science, they want science, but they don't want to be professors and fight for, for grants and so on. So later on, they are not uh, recognized as group leaders and they are less considered for, for prizes. But I think, I, I think differently. I think that having a, a family, especially having children, is something that men cannot have. Can you become pregnant? Can you, can you have a baby? It's only us that can, and emotionally, it's a present from wherever that we have, and we should be happy with this, and it's very, we, I, I talk about women, and it, in, in my opinion, it's possible to combine science and family if one, if the woman loves both, both of them. The word balance is, is, in my opinion, not correct. It's not balancing. It's just enjoying family and enjoying science. And I hope all of you young girls here enjoy your studies and then enjoy your science. And good luck to you. opinion, there is in France an emerging generation of women, scientist women, that where there will be Nobel Prize and many prizes. In France, I know some of them. I could give some name of a woman that will get the Nobel Prize soon. Uh, and uh, so the situation depends on the country. In France, the situation is not bad. It's not the worst in France. So. Uh, uh, and I suppose, for example, in the U.S., the situation is much more difficult for women uh, because um, uh, young scientists have to move from one university to the other frequently, and so it's difficult to uh, have a family life when you are always traveling from place to place. But uh, I don't know what is the situation in Israel. I suppose the situation is not bad also in Israel for women, uh, uh, more or less like in France. Uh, no. No? Not as good. Not as good, okay. No. But uh, do you agree that in France uh, the situation became better for women? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Become so. Slowly. But, but I know very smart women. No, it's yeah. becoming slowly better. of the way uh, physics and mathematics are taught in your country? Um, do, I, do I have to repeat? <laughs> uh, what do you think of the way physics and mathematics are taught in your country? Um, in the teaching. Oh, um, mostly high school. Okay, so um, do you want the truth or politically correct answer? <laughs> Um, the situation is uh, uh, rather not very satisfying in France. Um, it's not due to teachers. It's uh, mainly due to the, the fact that uh, slowly but surely everything a little bit sophisticated, a little bit abstract is, t is being taken out of the program. So proofs in mass, in mathematical teaching, have disappeared from textbooks and classes. So the idea that you would have six years of mass without any proof, it just makes no sense, right? Uh, you know, much better to do less, but to do it well. 
And uh, so those are, it should be common sense. Everybody should, uh, should agree on that, but unfortunately, the trend is not going in the right direction. However, there is a terrible uh, discrepancy between high schools. I get that the French students are coming from Lycée Louis Grand, yes? And uh, the, situation, uh, the situation in such high schools is, uh, might be very, very different from uh, uh, the situations in uh, Lay's favorite high schools. So the, the fact that the, the, the programs are becoming, you know, emptier and emptier is in fact uh, creating much more inequality, creating inequalities. Again, it's common sense, everybody knows it, but politicians still uh, are still ignoring it. I think that uh, it's quite frightening how slowly education changes. And I would like to propose that a law be passed that you can teach nothing at school that you can't find in Google. And that I think would change things greatly. It seems to me that if you can find something by just looking it up, uh, why would we learn it? You know, and uh, I think this is something which we need to learn how to work with these tools. With your permission, one sentence about the previous discussion. Uh, I, I have many, many prizes. One of them is the Nobel Prize. But a few years before I got it, I got a prize that is much more important for me. The grandma of the year is Ada Yonat. And this, this prize is hanged on my wall. And when I ask my granddaughter, which year you mean? Because every prize has a year. And she said, you have to reprove yourself every year. And I'll take it off the wall if you miss. And it's still on the wall. Girls, it's possible. Uh, about the evolution of uh, teaching in, in uh, math, we heard already in physics, it's the same. Uh, and be because the level of mathematics has declined since my time. Uh, there is a lot of things that you cannot ask the students in physics. I, I told to you before about the fact that I was able to, to compute the velocities of satellites. I think students cannot do that anymore now. On the other hand, they can be asked a kind of qualitative question. What is, what is a Higgs boson, for instance? So I find it quite strange that you assume that the uh, students should be able to answer this kind of quiz questions and not be taught elementary things about physics and saying this is a big problem in, in today's evolution. I remember one day I said that, uh, I was uh, interviewed on, on a French radio station and I said, uh, now in physics, uh, students are given a kind of journalistic education. They have, have to be able to talk about biology and about physics in qualitative terms. And, and the uh, anchor man answered, what do you have against journalists? <laughs> I said, nothing against journalists, but I think something deeper should be done in, in, in high school for education of students. And again, I think you're in a better position in, in Louis Le Grand, in some uh, high schools. Uh, but even in your uh, high school, I think the level, what you are asked is different and is less deep than it was long ago, and I don't want to be nostalgic, and I know that you have a lot of other things to, to learn, but I think it's very important to be very demanding and to, to try to learn the important things early on in your life. Oui? Il n'y a pas de micro? What are the relationships between scientists, given that you often work in teams? Is the spirit rather competitive or friendly? Uh, we have both. <laughs> uh, competition, of course, uh, between uh, different teams, uh, but also working uh, together, and then it depends probably about the, the discipline, but in my discipline, I must say that I can see more and more uh, consortium 
of uh, researchers working together uh, for doing multidisciplinary uh, science, which means that uh, you have things coming from different areas, basic science, uh, chemistry, mathematics, even in, in, in biological science, more and more biostatistics, uh, chemists, etc., etc. So big, large consortium working together, but competition exists. And um, I used to say that uh, at a uh, low or moderate dose, competition is good for the progress of science. I think it exists between, this competition exists between different groups, but uh, within the same team, competition is dangerous. Huh? Okay, so it's better to have a team working together and, and a laboratory with competition between different teams also is not the best situation. So here, again, um, mathematics is a bit of an outlier. We don't have big teams, we don't have huge experiments. And um, obviously there's competition, everybody wants to... It's sort of very frustrating if you think about something for a long time and then somebody else posts uh, a result doing what you wanted. But I find that in mathematics, I think cooperation is a more... Uh, People are surprisingly generous with their ideas and sort of, um, I think, in many ways, cooperation is quite strong in mathematics. Si, si, il marche. I agree that there is a good uh, aspect of competition if it's a healthy competition. But there is another problem, that the fact that scientists now have to rely more and more on contracts and they have to ask for money all the time. And this is a kind of competition which can be bad because they are, have a tendency, when you do that, to oversell your results, to try to make promises that you don't believe in yourself because it's a part of the game if you want to get money. And I think this is a limit of competition. Uh, it should not go to that point. And this kind of competition has even led to unethical behavior, publishing wrong things, cheating in publication. This happens more and more, and you should, of course, be aware of that and understand that this is just killing all the values that we were talking about before, about the truth in research and so on. Now, the competition at the level when you respect the other team, when you learn from others, the, and also which give you the feeling that you belong to a, co a world community working to achieve interesting goals. This is a good aspect of competition, but you should be aware of not letting yourself get too much into a kind of struggle in which you will try to overcome by using means which are the, uh, really at the boundary of uh, ethical behavior. Okay, these um, people em try to emphasize too much the result. Make there is less probity and honesty in the publications than before. There is we are in a negative slope on the, from this uh, side. Uh, oh, pardon. I want to be a bit more positive than the last two uh, pessimistic ideas. Science is, does, is done by human beings. And some human beings are more competi competitive than others. You can see it in the kindergarten. I am the, the nicest or the tallest or the what. Even in the kindergarten, it means some people are more, more competing than some others. Of course, the conditions are not always supporting a non-competition, but if we compare it to politics, to art, to theater, to dancing, who is more competing? Scientists or all these uh, professions? This is just human beings. Situation can be more difficult, money can be more difficult, but competition 
is less than in many other uh, occupations of human beings. I totally agree with that statement. Life sciences are human sciences. They have to be shared and communicated within all of our scientific groups. Si ça soit en France, si ça soit en Deutschland, en Italie, partout dans le monde. Ce qui est essentiel, c'est l'éducation et la communication de l'éducation à les plus jeunes âges pour expliquer à cet âge quelle est la valeur réelle de cette preuve scientifique ou cette découverte scientifique. C'est ces valeurs-là qui permettent les jeunes d'augmenter et de réaliser et de prendre une nouvelle responsabilité pour que la science ne soit jamais utilisée contre l'humanité ou dans un sens qui n'est pas pour le partage de bonheur de toutes les cultures et tous les êtres humains. Autre question Oui. Um, I have a question about, uh, linked to the one uh, about absolute truth. Uh, you said that the absolute truth does exist in mathematics, for example. Um, and obviously there are subjects in which you can say that something is truth or, or not. But does an absolute truth uh, exist in every scientific domain and in every domain of in philosophy or, for example, or in humanities in general? And uh, as physics, mathematics are becoming more and more important in our society, uh, what role will play for um, humanities in the future? Peut-être on peut passer la parole à quelqu'un qui n'a pas le prix Nobel, mais qui travaille dans les sciences de la Terre. Well, thank you very much. Catherine has asked me to answer you, and uh, it's a place to say I'm a geophysicist. I am not a Nobel Prize winner by far, but I'm struck by the fact that we here have mostly people who have been recognized for their work in mathematics, physics, chemistry, the life sciences. No one from the earth sciences and geosciences, which is my field. And in some of the answers I would have given to uh, many of the questions you young people have asked would have been slightly different. And the last one you asked is such an example. In the, life, in the earth sciences, at least, we are working based on a triangle, observation, theory, computer modeling. Because computer modeling is becoming so beautiful, so easy, big memories, fast computer time, it's cheaper to have a doctoral or a postdoc student working on a theoretical problem on his computer than sending him to Tibet to the top of the world to collect a rock and measure its age in millions or billions of years. Observations are being relinquished at the present time and the link between these three tripods that I was just mentioning is uh, not going in the good direction. So, For all of you young people, I would suggest first that the earth sciences is a fabulous field. We, in our generation, the generation of the people in this half of the room, we have had plate tectonics. We have had the complete revolution of our understanding. Everything that was taught from 1900 to 1965, many of us were students then and learned that way, was completely tossed away, became wrong. The problem is we have only one earth. In physics, you can do many experiments. You don't have a hundred Earths to experiment with. Experimentation is important in the Earth sciences, but is not sufficient. Again, observation, reasoning about billion years time scales, very long space scales, and the role of uncertainties is such. I was very struck by the presentation of uh, uh, Professor Aumann, the third one you heard uh, on uh, Uh, we, have the, uh, we must agree to disagree. I think this is an absolutely essential thing, and that's why I interrupted rudely by saying the sum must be smaller than one. In the earth sciences, depending on how you define the words, we, ha we say in French, les mots valises. There are words that have to be defined very carefully. That theorem we saw indeed requires very careful demonstration, uh, I mean, uh, definition of its words. And in some disciplines, it would be different from others. 
Uh, I think that in the earth sciences, you can have people who think uh, at two-third probability, both of them, that something that doesn't agree with each other is correct. They should be allowed to agree to disagree and not turn their scientific debate into an ideology. Merci beaucoup. Alors, on va passer la parole aux jeunes d'abord. Micro. Do you think science do you think science can resolve every problem, can answer every question, can explain every fact, every phenomenon, or sometimes uh, phenomenons, facts, questions cannot have uh, answer? That's a really nice question. I think that uh, it depends what you mean by explaining. So, for example, if you say, could I say what you're going to do with all the best science in the world in one year's time, I think that's impossible. There are certain things. I mean, the chaos is intrinsic to mathematics, and there are certain things that are unpredictable. So, but given that framework, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to deal with uh, everything. Obviously, you can define problems that you can't deal with, but I believe, certainly, as was raised by uh, before, the problems that the Earth is facing right now, I think all have scientific solutions. I think there will be scientific solutions to economies, scientific solutions to politicians, to human relationships. I think all of these things are much more difficult than maybe mathematical equations, but I think the scientific method can help enormously for them. Um, but I think that's a little bit different from saying there will be a theory of everything. I think uncertainty and chaos is something we have not to forget. It's very, very important to realize that things are actually not knowable. Oui, je, je suis entièrement d'accord avec votre point de vue. I'm very, I agree with you completely. Mais je vais parler en français parce qu'on est en France. Je pense que le problème, ce n'est pas simplement le privilège de choisir un, un science, un life science, mathématique, la médecine. C'est de partager à travers l'éducation continue et l'évaluation d'un groupe, pas simplement de science, mais les applications de science. Moi, j'ai le privilège de diriger les MD-PhD programs dans plusieurs endroits à plusieurs langues. Aujourd'hui, je vais parler en français, mais demain matin, italien, et heute morgen, besser deutsch. C'est le privilège d'admettre que la science, c'est un partage avec toutes les autres applications et avec tous les autres niveaux. Ça peut être fondamental, ça peut être intégré, ça peut être par rapport d'une patiente, par rapport d'une industrie, par rapport d'une application. Et donc, je suis entièrement d'accord avec vous. Le problème est simplement que nous devrons aujourd'hui savoir communiquer, intégrer et partager nos communications pour que des jeunes, et je suis très heureux de voir des étudiants ici, c'est un honneur pour nous, d'avoir les étudiants ici qui posent la question mais c'est à vous aussi de prendre la responsabilité de créer ces groupes intégrés constamment avec un système d'évaluation et un système de communication qui valorise le privilège de toute science. Merci. Je voudrais parler en français, mais je n'ai qu'un tour. Okay. Uh, um, I'd like to propose to you young people a problem, the last great problem of science. The last, and I, I, I want to propose to you, work on it, think about it. The last, when I was a young man, uh, life was not understood. What is life? 
And now, shortly after I was a young man, this problem was solved. The DNA, Crick's, Watson, yes, life is understood now. I think life is understood. Not the details, yes, Ada, you're not uh, uh, helped with one of the details or with a large part of the details, but in principle, it's understood. What is life? It's some kind of chemical machine. Okay, very good. Um, what is not understood at all, at all, is consciousness. Yes, we experience, we see, we, we have pain, we have pleasure, we desire, we feel. What is this? How does consciousness work? Yeah, this is the last great frontier of science, totally ununderstood. How does it work? So I want to say something. I mean, science is sort of a great, uh, a great thing. It allows us to build one upon the other. It sort of does incredible things. But it, of course, can't be a solution to all, uh, all problems. I mean, one could um, uh, develop a new drug that cures people almost magically from hepatitis C, which is, was a very serious disease, but I mean, that's not, uh, doesn't solve the question of um, how, does not solve all the questions, doesn't solve the question how to supply uh, healthcare, there's sort of a lot, um, does not, in this particular example, there are people who are dying because somehow the medicine is priced uh, in very high price, much higher than the cost of uh, producing the drug. Um, in general, if you see the history, science has been a great uh, force for, growth, for progress, but it has also been used to justify things which are, uh, which are quite uh, evil. It was, uh, eugenics was considered a science in the early um, 20th century. So science is a wonderful thing, but it's not a solution to all of the problems of mankind. Jean-Pierre? I'm in here as a, as a guest uh, since uh, I have a long relationship between the Weizmann Institute and the Pasteur Institute. And uh, I must say, I was one of the founding fathers of uh, the association uh, Pasteur Weizmann. Uh, we founded Elvoff many years ago, so I'm here as a friend. But I am also here as a neuroscientist. And I was uh, pleased to say that uh, this is something that uh, we have to understand more. And uh, nobody yet uh, among these people present here has spoken about the brain. <laughs> and in fact, science is made and built up by our brain. And uh, this is uh, raising, of course, uh, uh, very important issues. And uh, also perhaps some, not I want to say answer, but uh, ways of uh, thinking about truth. This question was raised several times. I understand that for the younger people, this is a preoccupation. And uh, it is actually a fundamental issue. Is there an absolute truth? Well, the issue is that uh, this is depending on how our brain works. And uh, what uh, we have to say is all the views we have about the world, even the facts and the theories, are mediated by our brain. And the issue that, as scientists, we are trying to solve is the relationship between what we produce in our brain and what the real world is outside our brain. So uh, this is, uh, of course, raising a, a very interesting issue, uh, which has to do with the knowledge of the cognitive functions uh, and of uh, how does our brain work. And just to say a few words, this is a whole field of knowledge which is progressing. Unfortunately, I am nearly the only one here to, to speak about it. But uh, for those uh, who are uh, younger uh, person involved, I think this is a, a fascinating field of, uh, of interest for the future. And I would just, uh, not to be too long, <coughs> but uh, to say that 
everything we know about the world is uh, mediated by our brain. And uh, the validity of a theory is the adequation of what we have in our brain and what's happening outside our brain. Is there any adequation? And this is exactly what we are fighting for. Science is not reaching for an absolute truth, is to progress in our knowledge of the world, and not only the physical knowledge, but also the social knowledge, and the responsibility, and this was emphasized by Serge, the responsibility we have, being scientists, between what we produce as scientists and what is being done by the human beings of this knowledge. And this is a very, very important responsibility that we have to face. And I hope that being scientists, being young like you are, you may have inside your head, in fact, the view that the progress is knowledge, is also a progress in the humanity and the sense of others that we can build from our brain. I think that the question about uh, whether science has the ability to solve most of our problems is extremely interesting, but it's um, partially not sufficient. You know, scientists are part of society. They are only a community that is not necessarily that powerful and not necessarily that uh, influential. And we need other parts of the society in order to implement the solution. Take, take for example, the issue of climate change that threatens our very planet. Many people don't believe in it from religious regions. They don't believe in it because they say that God, whoever God is, will not harm its uh, people, the one that created shape. The same for genetically modified organisms or plants that is critically needed in, in poor countries, like in Africa, in India, overpopulated countries. People say that we shouldn't touch genetically anything. It's all created in the shape of God. So even if the problem will be solved in the laboratory, it doesn't necessarily mean that the public will buy it. There is the church in the middle, there are the politicians, there are the financiers, and so on and so forth. And even if a problem is solved, and let's say that tomorrow we shall defeat cancer or defeat uh, brain diseases, the cost is going to be so high that the, that the achievement is not going to be accessible to people, not only in Africa, but not also to all people in Israel, and not also to all people in France itself. So when we have a solution, think about France today, think about Israel today, think about modern technology. It's not available to everybody, or people have to stand in line forever. So I think that scientists as a community need to open a dialogue in the society, with all parts of society, with the politicians, and with the religious institutions, with sociologists, and with other people, in order, with other groups, very powerful group, in order to make the achievements implementable and, um, and beneficial to humankind. It's not enough to be isolated in the laboratory and to get a Nobel Prize or any other accolade that is uh, shared within the community and is not part of the whole society, because otherwise it's, it's useless. It's useless. True, the history tells us that in the last century, which was kind of the magic century, the 20th century, many of the achievements were implemented, but at the same time also the gaps in society increased. There are billions of people who are poor, who are living on one or two dollars a day. They don't have vitamins in their diet. I'm not talking about sophisticated medical devices. So the achievements are mostly arrived at the, those that are affluent, at those that can afford it. And therefore, I think that these questions should not stay within the scientific community. And should, we should really, and I think that scientists, the blame is partially on the shoulders of the scientists because we sit in this ivory tower and we say, just give us money and we shall do the research and we shall solve the problem. But that's far from being sufficient. We should be not only at the service of society, but proactively in the service of society and, and dialoguing and conversing with all powerful and, and influential parts of our society. And that's, I think, the beauty of democracy. Unlike other type of uh, governing regimes, that 
we should talk to one another and convince that we have a solution and then talk about the implementation of the solution. Bon, je pense que uh, we should stop now because uh, ah, tu veux dire un mot Yves Non Non, no, I think we, we because we have to prepare the room for uh, uh, bon, OK, one more. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm a geologist. I'd like to bring an idea which so far has not been developed so much during this conference. And this is the interest of history. We love history. I, when I was a boy, I wanted to be an archaeologist. What does an archaeologist do? He, he digs the earth to try to reconstruct what happened. Well, who were the people that were there and how did they live? Now, earth sciences and geology is exactly the same question. What is the history of the Earth? How did it become the way it is? And physics, chemistry, mathematics, modeling is only a tool to really reconstruct the history of the Earth. And I think we have a love for history, most of us, and we need to understand. And uh, somebody said uh, some minutes ago that th when he was a boy, the Earth was supposed to be two billion years old and now it's more than 4.5. How come? What is the truth? What is the history of the Earth? It's something you have a lot of work to do. You need not to be a, a high-notch scientist. You need not to be a physicist. You need not to be a chemist. You have to, be, to have interest in the history. And then you use the tools that help you to reconstruct the history of the Earth. Thank you. OK. So now I think we should stop. We heard about uh, physics, mathematics, chemistry, biology, but also, also to complex systems like the Earth, the brain, the brain, which is very important.